All right. Um, welcome, everyone. So quick reminder of the antitrust policy notice. Please review that. Let us know if you have any questions. All right, moving into the agenda. Uh, so a couple things today, uh, event reminders, uh, update on the annual TSC election results. Then we have some quarterly updates, both projects and uh, work groups. Um, and then if any other topics come up, let's dive in. All right, so uh, on the event side, next HackFest, October 3rd and 4th in Montreal, uh, registration link is in there. Please be sure to uh, get registered if you plan to attend. And again, reminder, this is directly following Member Summit uh, in Montreal, that's the two days prior to that. Uh, the next thing is we are looking to keep the cadence going for the quarterly hack fest. We're looking at uh, Asia Pacific. We've been in Europe and the US the last few times. So we do have a doodle poll together for this. Uh, let me just drop this into the TSC chat One moment. Please indicate your availability there. Uh, we are trying to steer clear of Chinese New Year. Um, and some of the other industry events. So we have three weeks identified, one in January, uh, February, and March. Uh, from there, we will hone in on location and exact timing and get that scheduled so people have plenty of time to sort that into your busy schedules. And then lastly, uh, we'll just continue to remind everyone, Hyperledger Global Forum, December 12th to 15th in Basel, Switzerland. This is our flagship event for the entire ecosystem. Uh, so a lot of technical content uh, and hands-on sessions there, uh, as well as more business-focused sessions. All right. Any questions on any of those events? Uh, it's, worth, up. it's worth noting because I know a lot of people submitted talks. We'll oh, yes. Getting, we've, been, we've been processing the talks, uh, and we'll get back to submitters pretty soon. We don't want to give a specific date, but but we know people's travel plans, et cetera, depend partly on it. So um, you'll hear from us very soon. Hello, it's Marta. Um, Baohua, did um, you have a question? Yeah, yeah about the uh, Asia Pacific uh, um, event. Uh, actually, we promoted in the China community and uh, also I saw there's some uh, while already voting the time slot. Okay, excellent. Thank, thank you for that. All right, any other uh, event questions before we move on? All right, uh, so the next one, the annual TSC election, the uh, election phase of that did conclude last night. So with the agenda that went out, I included the list of new names. Uh, so here it is on the, the shared screen, um, or you can look through the minutes, uh, many similar faces, but we are also welcoming uh, Mark and Silas to the TSC for the next 12 months. So congratulations to those reelected and those newly elected. Um, and we, we look forward to continuing all the great work here. So the other thing on the, go ahead. Oh, and, and thank you to Jonathan Levy and to Greg Haskins for having served in the TSC for the last two years, I believe. Absolutely, yes. And was there, was there a question? All right. Uh, I, just, I just wonder what was, what was the problem, can you elaborate on the problem that a lot of people did not receive uh, the, the ballot? It, it's not entirely clear. So uh, we've used this, um, the platform that the election was run on for at, at least the five and a half years I've been at the Linux Foundation across many, many projects, uh, both electing in the technical community and the boards, et cetera. Uh, and every time, you know, we'll see a couple ballots go to people's spam, spam boxes or different things like that, uh, which is normal. This time, um, it was much more than we've seen in the past. Uh, so I don't know exactly why that was the case. Um, but the one thing I will say is for, we resent the ballots multiple times. Everyone that reached out and requested one, um, with the exception of Friday, we typically responded in a matter of minutes and they all confirmed receiving the ballots that got resent. Uh, and then in terms of a voter percentage, it was consistent with um, the voter percentage turnout from the last two years as well. Um, so that left me feeling confident uh, as well. So for everyone that ha dealt with the challenges there, really, really apologize. Um, but I do think we were able to get everyone taken care of in the end. 
Great, thank you. All right. And finally, also thanks for everybody who ran. Um, it was great to have such a um, really large selection of um, candidates to choose from. Indeed. And then the last thing I'll say there is uh, the TSC chair nominations will begin directly following this call. Uh, so an email will just go to the 11 uh, elected TSC members of U11. If you're interested to run for the chair position, uh, please let please let us know within the next week. Uh, from there, we'll compile the nominations and do a one week um, election phase from that. And as a reminder, the TSC chair uh, does sit on the governing board then for the next 12, uh, 12 months uh, in tandem with their term on the TSC. Hey, Todd. Yes. One, one thing that was not in the uh, you know rules or not rules, but guidelines you had sent out was when the election is final. Um, so am I on the TSC effective as soon as you send the announcement out or is it is there a certain date transition time? Yeah, um, we'll, we'll have it effective for today. Um, it did it did conclude last night. So we should consider it effective today. And then the new chair position would be effective uh, two weeks from now. Uh, and therefore join the October board meeting as well. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, any other questions here? All right, sounds good. Uh, so with that, let's uh, hop over to the various updates. So the first one is uh, Composer. Anyone from the Composer team on? And I know Tracy connected with them again last night. It doesn't look like anything has made it into the wiki still. Uh, Composer team? And Tracy, did you hear anything back? I, I know you had pinged again last night. Uh, I haven't had a chance to check my email this morning. Um, I hadn't as of yesterday afternoon. I can uh, quickly do a search and see. Okay. No, no response. All right. Um, We'll, we'll continue to reach out there. Um, all right, um, Burrow. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. I'll drop Great. the link into uh, the Rocket Chat as well. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I'm uh, well, very glad to have been elected onto the TSC, uh, firstly, that was nice. Um, so, Burrow, um, so uh, on Project Health, um, Borough has been going through via the agreements network uh, a succession of, uh, of test networks that we've imaginatively named uh, T1, T2, and we're now on T3. Um, and that has meant I've been doing a lot of firefighting, but it also means there's been quite a lot of interesting feedback from uh, our network co-founders, um, users of Borough um, in the context of, a, of an observable network that I can, can poke. So things like, um, realizing that we had like a 10 minute load time because uh, we weren't lazy loading our Merkle tree. Uh, and that only really, really came up when we were looking at 10, 20 gigabytes of chain data over a two week spread. So that's been giving lots of useful um, feedback. Um, code wise, um, I think it's probably been like the best part of a, of a, of a quarter, at least a three month spread straddling a couple of quarters um, where I felt like I've, still been doing a large amount of paying down of technical debt that period is now over um and i'm actually pretty happy with um the way the lot, a lot of the code looks now um so so this quarter we've really been able to focus on adding features so things like um our etl system so we have a um work in progress that builds a, a sql uh, postgres uh, query store um driven by execution events um that is operates in a sort of kind of slightly Kafka style stateless manner. So it will pick up from a, a previous height and um, build a table schema against um, a Solidity contract. Um, we've also got uh, the basic governance primitive um, and a few other features that I can move on to. So um, in terms of features and code, uh, quite pleased with how things are going. Um, 
but, but a lot of issues coming up that we just hadn't really seen when it was being used predominantly in one or two node networks. Now we're running with 20 um, in Kubernetes um, and a, a lot of developers using it uh, for prototypes. So, so that's been good. Um, community engagement is pretty good. Um, there's, there's plenty of people to chat to and bring up issues on the Hyperledger chat. Um, what uh, a kind of frustration has been for a lot of our users, which is kind of understandable, but with the resources, it was hard to avoid, is as we were consolidating our, our, our tools, um, uh, a lot of stuff was fragmented. There was a lot of out-of-date documentation. It was quite hard to track various um, Cartesian products of stuff that would actually work together. Um, so now what we've got is we've got a load of tooling that used to live in a, a Monax repo is now all baked into the, the borough binary. So we have our deploy tool, which used to be Eris package manager, used to be Boz, is now borough deploy. Um, and we were able to move that in because we developed a, uh, an Apache 2 licensed ABI, which is Ethereum's um, bi uh, binary standard for the EVM uh, that allows us to actually pack function calls and send them in. So you know how burrow start, burrow keys, burrow deploy, you can pretty much uh, run the whole chain from that single binary. So um, at this stage, we're really in a good place to have um, a, a push on documentation uh, because that effort is not going to be wasted when another refactor happens. There's going to be a lot more stability, particularly in, it, in the general outline of the project and the tools. Um, so we'd certainly like some help uh, from, from the Hyperledger community uh, where possible on the, on documentation. Um, another frustration has been um, last quarter, I was fairly confident that I'd be able to announce two or three uh, new maintainers outside of Monax. Unfortunately, one of those developers just got reallocated um, uh, uh, from working on, on Burrow and it hasn't been contributing since. And another two, even more regrettably, ended up forking Burrow. Um, they, uh, they started off making some significant changes to Burrow, which I would have quite liked to integrate in, but they started from a copy and paste. Um, so we, we got them onto a main line, but uh, the developers that were working on that really wanted to change a lot of incidental stuff. And Burrow was moving quite quickly, and I, I, tried to, I tried to pull them back from the brink. They could still even be depending on us as a library, but um, it's a real shame because they were doing some interesting work around verifiable random functions to uh, control the churn of validators. Um, so that was a bummer. Um, really. Uh, but still, Burrow has uh, four full-time developers uh, from Monax, um, and uh, we're, we'll be hiring more and, and, and also probably getting, trying to get some, some of our co-founders from the agreements network to, to start making some pull requests. Um, but we, we, I would welcome any advice uh, or help on uh, improving our diversity, main, uh, uh, maintainer diversity. Um, on under issues here, yeah, so help with documentation, help with maintainers, I've mentioned. Um, a couple of more general points, I'm not sure how uh, neatly they fit into the update on Burrow, but um, one thing that would be a, a real multiplier, particularly for smaller projects, and I think more generally for projects in Hyperledger, would be some kind of shared um, uh, testing framework or infrastructure, possibly even something super supervised by like an SRE or, or testing engineer type person. Um, so, for example, uh, something that I could spin up uh, some of our Kubernetes Helm charts and do a load of load testing on. Um, and if there was some reporting and some metrics, a lot of this stuff takes up quite a bit of time. You know, like I was setting up Elasticsearch or setting up metrics viewers and so on. But it's actually very generic across projects. So it would be um, pretty useful for us. And I think for others, if that, was, if that could be provided by Hyperledger, um, on a similar vein, uh, common release infrastructure would be good. So I've started pushing cross-compiled binaries, and I'm now pushing finally to the um, Hyperledger Docker um, repo. Uh, but what would also be nice is if we had access to app or yum or, um, or snap flat pack repositories um, uh, to, to push releases through. Because um, again, they, they tend to shift you off the main focus of your work. Um, releases, releases have been much better than they had previously, and this is a, um, a side effect of the, uh, the, the refactor had, uh, having been done. So we've made roughly a monthly release, um, and that V021 release had a, a, a ton of new features kind of cemented in there, um, stripped out our previous RPC layers. We're now doing everything over gRPC, which has got rid of a lot of issues. Um, so the release cadence has been fairly good, and the, the change log is, is linked in the update. Um, 
so in terms of activity, yeah, it's, it's more than it has been, but it's not as much as I would like. We've had several pull requests um, and issues that have demonstrated actual bugs. Uh, in particular, we seem to be unable to reset um, uints uh, back to zero, which is, a, which is a strange one that we're looking into now. Um, but that's good. These have been actually actionable compared to what we had previously been getting, which was a lot more of, um, can you help with this? Oh, I don't understand because the, the docs weren't good enough, et cetera. Um, so a uh, quick run through of some of the features. We've now got a uh, complete historical transactions, so we can go back to any, any block height and we can have a, like an execution trace uh, of what the EVM run events that are emitted. It's kind of a, a very like, this is what happened object and you can query any range. Um, we've got our uh, SQL database uh, mapping layer, which is kind of under development. Um, there's a state checkpointing mechanism, which basically means that we can survive brown, uh, brown outs a, a bit, bit more easily by going back to a previous block and catching up with the network rather than stopping in a uh, corrupted state. Uh, GRPC inter interfaces everywhere. We've integrated our key service, which again used to be another um, satellite repo uh, into the borough binary. So it can act as a delegated key signer both for our uh, command line tooling and for the borough validator itself. Uh, we've developed the, uh, the Apache 2 licensed um, ABI, which is now part of borough. Um, we've added Prometheus metrics and a profiling service for some debug. And then we have this uh, governance TX, which allows you to do batch updates to as many contracts as you need at a time, or contracts slash accounts. So this is the basic mechanism. It needs some policies and voting to be built on top of it, but it's a basic mechanism that will allow you to do um, uh, network upgrades by vote. Um, um, so current plans, um, so there are three buckets of work um, that, that I'm trying to focus on uh, now and this, this quarter, probably the next one as well. One is chain stability. Some of this is chasing uh, Tendermint, uh, which changes a lot and breaks stuff a lot. Um, although they are trying to break stuff um, uh, sooner rather than later and they're, they're, they themselves are starting to stabilize. Um, it also involves being able to uh, make sure that when we do have a, 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 an upgrade or um, some sort of a bug that we can actually get the application state out. So to that end um, and using some of the version history that we now have, we're looking at um, a kind of version rollback. So uh, git reset hard, uh, git rebase effectively on the chains as well as um, emitting our state into a, a database agnostic form. Uh, so like a dump, dump restore kind of functionality. Um, then in terms of the issues we see in production um, about corruption and uh, sharing persistent volumes, self-healing in Kubernetes, um, as these things come up, and it, for example, issues with connectivity, weird timeouts, adding a lot more diagnostics and just getting the thing so it's stable and when it does break, you understand why. Uh, the second bucket is governance. So currently the governance is based on a very uh, crude, a single root permission, which you can wrap behind multi-sig. What I like is for these governance transactions to be transactions in stasis or proposals that can then be voted on uh, by a, either the network quorum of validators or by a separate quorum um, or kind of any manner of like a uh, voting system to say that uh, this, this network change, this token redistribution or this uh, code deploy should happen but that's all contained in this, this same mechanism. Um, and then the, the, the third bucket is looking into interacting with other chains. So in particular with Burrow's underlying um, EVM compatibility and also attracting Ethereum developers, um, it's, it's very useful to be able to anchor certain pieces of state on uh, a public chain. And in our case, the obvious one is Ethereum, such as the validator set so that if you can have a reliable source of the validator set. That's a way of implementing byte clients. Um, and also for uh, performing escrow in terms of token. So if you want to perform payments or if you want to um, establish a validator bonding token by a payment into an Ethereum smart contract, we need some integration. There's a lot of projects along this line. Um, there's Plasma Cash. Uh, there's a, a project called Loom, which is meant to be open sourcing this, this month. So we're we're looking into ways that we can, can do cross-chain communication. And then in the background, we have uh, Tenement's Cosmos, which uh, part of that specification is an inter-blockchain transaction that gets escalated to a hub blockchain. Um, so that's going to be increasing maybe in the next quarter, but the one afterwards. Um, I've mentioned about maintainer diversity. Uh, contributor diversity, again, slight uptick, but not much. We've had three to five um, 
contributions in terms of, well, I think like three PRs and then a couple of issues uh, that have been uh, pretty useful, uh, but nothing huge. And as I say, I think that's um, slightly down to uh, the, the changing, the, the shifting in, in the code that we've had. And it's, it's also partly down to, I think we have a lot of developer users who are building prototypes and they're building projects where the uh, long-term uh, stability of, of their projects is not assured. So they're not really uh, wanting to pay back into the, uh, into the framework perhaps yet. Um, so uh, yeah, also collaborating with Tenement on some underlying uh, data structure stuff through their, their Cosmos SDK, which uh, gets us a bit uh, more development help on some, one of our uh, core uh, piece in, internals. Um, yeah, so I think that's it. Hey, great update, Silas. Uh, this is Dan. Um, I was I didn't quite track your uh, your first uh, point there in, in current plans for chain stability. Could you maybe say in, in a little different words what you mean by being able to uh, look from like the get rebase illusion that that you could go back and uh, I guess go back in time. But that that doesn't imply you could edit history, though, right? Um, no. So well. Uh, yes and no. So, okay, th 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 there's two things to the same chain stability. Ultimate, ultimately, we want to have, uh, you know, an actually stable chain that would run for 100 years. Um, the next best thing when we're doing these successions of test networks is to be able to, by agreement with the rest of the network quorum, stop the chain, um, possibly when we have a, an incompatible upgrade, um, look at an issue that happened and possibly rewind state. So this isn't intended as a... Uh, a mechanism that is sort of recommended in principle for using Burrow or indeed any blockchain, um, but actually being able to coordinate it and realize that there was a, a code issue and not have to throw away most of the history and most of the state is the next best thing to it actually working. Um, it can also be f quite flexible uh, kind of operationally uh, if you want to do uh, like take a previous te test network go back to a particular block height and do a fork with that, with that state mechanism. So you could go in and like manually hack on the database, but we're trying to build a bit of tooling around this. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not, you know, intended to be a feature of the chain that it, 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 it overwrites its own history. That was probably a bit misleading in the Git rebase, but uh, that's more of an analogy that describes uh, what is, uh, I mean, a bit like Git rebase, uh, uh, some uh, performing a bit of surgery on, on the chains. Um, but, all of that stuff really helps us investigate issues that affect uh, the chain stability. So, and the, also things like being able to like step through in a debug mode, multiple chains and what, what particular interaction uh, caused them to uh, disagree on the previous application hash or something like that. Does that clarify or concern? No, it, it sounds interesting. So it sounded like maybe two things. One is a bit of utility so that you can do some debug and, uh, the other, maybe some sort of uh, uh, actual uh, network fixing, or at least in the case of the test net. That's that's right. Yes, I sorry I, that that should have been um, more clearly separated. Yeah, they, they are quite different things. Uh, one one supports the other, but the the the, the global bucket of work uh, is is just working on chain stability. So uh, we've got like a kind of chaos monkey type thing that I'm setting up now where we just continually redeploy all of the agreements network. Um, and that should generate a load of stuff, I guess, not exactly fuzzing, but it's along those lines and just trying to make these issues happen before they happen in production and then obviously fixing them. But this is the, the, um, the uh, chain history stuff is about uh, having tools that you can actually work with uh, once you've identified a, a, an issue. Great. Uh, and then something else that you said that caught my ear was uh, you were suggesting that if we had some some common infrastructure, uh, that that would be helpful. Um, say just a little bit more about that. So I think I was talking to Casey a little bit about um, this on the on the testing infrastructure. So I think, for example, like the um, cloud native computing foundation federation foundation um that they have some shared infrastructure for this so i think the, uh, the the advantage to having something like this from my point of view would be uh just reducing the surface area of stuff that we have to operate and increasing the visibility of where projects are in testing so 
if you think about, so, I mean, we're going to still be operating, for example, Kubernetes clusters for the agreements network, and we do borrow testing there, but it's not the most appropriate place to surface <coughs> um, stuff that's specifically about borrow. Um, if we had a, uh, a Kubernetes cluster that had Elasticsearch set up, um, that had uh, Kibana, some other um, introspection tools, then we could deploy there. People could come in, um, like, could potentially be open, or there could be some kind of Linux Foundation-based access. They could, uh, you know, look at the standard deviation of our block times on a particular version. They could uh, look at various um, test nets that were exhibiting bugs or, or not. Um, so there'd be observability from the outside. And then for the project, it would just mean that, uh, you know, like I, I spent about a week learning about elastic search sharding, which, you know, wasn't completely wasted, but it also meant I wasn't doing other stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what the le what level of gen generality we might hope to have, but if there was someone who was maybe working full or part time on, on improving this stuff, uh, then I'm sure for, for us anyway, we'd end up with a better testing infrastructure than we have and it would be more visible. Yeah, I, I think we see that from, from the project that I contribute most heavily on and we have over there a something that we call long running networks for for checking out integration testing for you know for periods beyond what you would normally do for ci so things for like uh, say a week and yeah there's there's a good bit of infrastructure there for spinning up the the cloud nodes and then providing some dashboards that show all sorts of stats about the the health of the network so I do see some commonality. I know that, that a lot of the stuff that we did would be specific for, for, for our project. So I, I don't know if a lot of the management and software would be the same, but maybe sort of the infrastructure as a service part would be uh, common. Maybe people could be iterating on you know, these dashboards and, and repurposing them for, for their usage as well. Uh, yeah, I think so. That's exactly what I meant. Is is the stuff that is not is a bit too long to run on CI, but you want to run at some sort of a cadence. Maybe you want to run it. You, know, you explicitly are pushing through it on a particular branch for longer term integration and so on. So yeah, I think the, the infrastructure as a service stuff could a lot of that. You know, there's, there's setting up a control plane in Kubernetes. There's um, you know making sure your Helm tiller, if like that's what we use, is there. I think where it gets quite interesting potentially is if there is a, uh, where there's an opportunity to actually abstract some gener generality around some of this stuff, uh, one place might be around network formation. So I, I would think that generally speaking, all of the, all of the projects will have some form of genesis um, that, you f that, that, that gets formed and then we have to do some key distribution or something like that. Um, and probably on top of that, we also change the validator set over time, bond on new validators. Um, and for us, that would involve uh, somehow securely communicating node IDs, which are a, an address of a particular key and validator IDs, which are a node. So there is this kind of like uh, public key infrastructure type gossip process where I could almost, I could kind of imagine you might be able to start up a single Genesis validator and then have some generic Kubernetes tooling wire everything up by uh, being the trusted broker at the beginning of that process to communicate public keys around um, the payload of that would depend on the project um, but but that could be a potentially interesting you know if, if, if there was a net, if there was a hyperledger network boot thing that could potentially be an interesting top level project but uh, for this to be useful you you know they, they could be their own islands but just have the shared infrastructure okay thanks and then uh, the last thing that stuck out to me is uh, your, your call for more participation in, in contributors and maintainers. And I think for anybody who's, who's listening on this call, you're probably also the, the sort of people that are, are uh, monitoring the TSE mailing list. Uh, and, and hopefully we've got a, a wide sweep on that. But it seems like we would have uh, an intersection of, of, uh, uh, <clears throat> of the things that, that we've seen on, on the TSE list over the last few days about the the uh, diversity on the TSC, along with this opportunity here to get involved in in one of the uh, 
you know, I was going to say one of the more exciting projects, but that, that's, uh, that's probably not the best way to put it. So, uh, Burrow is a pretty unique project in, in straddling some large communities between Ethereum uh, and Hyperledger and being able to make, make it the and there instead of the or. Uh, so I think if there's if there's folks listening out there that are looking for a way to get engaged, it sounds like there's a really good opportunity to help fill out more of the contributions for Borough. And for those that are interested, that would you know start to give you increasing uh, technical depth and engagement with the community that you know a year from now would would put you in a position to uh, help represent those views on on this committee. Yeah, I mean, that would be great. I think, um, you know, I, I carry some guilt for, for this in the, in the sense of, I think, particularly when I've been busy coding, you know, I, I, I'll talk to a new contributor, try and get them set up. And if they don't hear from me for a while, and because, I mean, Casey's in there as well, but there's a relatively limited number, and particularly if the codes all moved, you know, they get disillusioned and, and, and don't want to do it. Um, then with these developers who end up forking, I don't know, to be honest, they, they started off going in that direction to start, start with, but... They made a lot of kind of incidental changes, and I kind of wonder whether I should have just let them let them merge some of that stuff. Maybe they would have stuck around. But um, yeah, I'm definitely open to advice uh, and any help in sort of m making sure those people who who latch on initially and might stay interested uh, don't feel like they're being neglected, basically. Um, but uh, so another thing we've done is like the issues on GitHub are massively cleaned up, and we've got some like starter issue tagging stuff there as well. Um, and and like I say, with documentation. The, the the borough binary divides into like uh, six uh, subcommands, six main subcommands. Uh, each of those could probably be relatively easily documented um, if anyone wants to contribute to documentation or or use contributing to documentation as a way in. Yeah, so I was actually going to ask you about the fork you mentioned in the in the report there. I mean, uh, you partially res answered this now, I guess. You don't really know why. Uh, and, I, you know, fork is an inherent part of open source development for better and for worse, right? It's very powerful. It's an important piece. At the same time, there's a lot of wasted efforts because people fork sometimes for no good reasons. And it's a constant struggle to try to keep everybody, you know, working together. And so... I know that you know we have had uh, this challenge. I've seen it on the fabric side, for instance, where people make contributions, they issue a PR equivalent to CR, and and then if the maintainers don't make an effort to you know merge those quickly enough, then people get turned off, which is natural. And and you know so there is always this struggle about you know you you. You're doing your own development and as a maintainer you also have the responsibility to pay attention to the contribution and, and not discourage people i don't know if this is case you know fork also sometimes come from people saying well we have a very different point of view on the direction the project should take and so we're going to make our own changes and then they don't want to bother you know trying to merge and so it does i don't know in this case if there's any of that going on do you so, know well, I yeah, well, let, let, let me, um, I'd quite like to share some of that. So, I mean, I, I didn't want to like um, name them on the update just, you know, because that's a public public record. I mean, I guess this is as well, but um, they're, they're, they're galactic slash galactic is the fork. So I think there were there were a couple of things that led to the fork. Um, so on their side, we, we had a quite a good relationship with their CTO and we, we sent a few emails back and forth. Now, uh, they were under a lot of pressure to, uh, to get things out from their investors and they basically didn't feel like they had time to get stuff merged. Now, partly that was legitimate and partly that was because, for example, they started with the copy and paste rather than the git fork, which even if you were gonna fork, I don't really know why you do. So they chucked away the history initially. So then they got back onto our main line, but then I think because they'd started with a like copy and paste mentality, the developer who was actually fairly new to Go as well had, had gone and changed a lot of stuff that was either his taste or he didn't understand the reason it was that way already that really wasn't related to the main thrust, which made it kind of hard to merge his other stuff, which I was quite keen to, to get in in a module or something like that. Um, but he changed all of this other collateral. Um, and uh, so we went back and forth on that and then a load of code changed and then he found it frustrating to have to rebase that. Um, so unfortunately, I, I wish they'd come to us a bit earlier, but it was a bit like they hadn't, they'd come quite late, late in the process. 
and they'd already, you know, they only had, they, they had a foot half in the fork already. Um, having said that, I kind of, you know, wish, uh, that maybe I had have uh, j just like accepted some, some of the changes. We could have always un undone them, but, uh, you know, over time if they were negative, but, um, so yeah, they felt a lot of pressure from investors. I think as they are now, they've copy and paste forked a lot of stuff when they could easily be depending on us, a library. Um, and now they're missing a load of quite important security updates, a load of bug fixes, uh, everyone loses. Um, but we're still in contact. I don't know, you know, if, if they get their, their funding, I think maybe they might be interested in reintegrating it, but like, they've kind of gone even further on a lot of stuff, a lot of trivial stuff they didn't need to change now. So it's kind of like they're, they're even more entrenched probably. All right. Thanks. All right. Uh, good discussion. Good questions. Any, any other questions or comments for Silas? All right. Uh, thank you, Silas. Really appreciate it. Um, all right. Uh, final topic for the day, uh, Baohua. I know you wanted to talk quickly about Technical Working Group of China and uh, the chair there. Okay, sure. Let give me uh, uh, let give me give a quick uh, summary. Um, so the TWGC, uh, the Technical Working Group in China, it uh, currently was co-chaired by three persons. Uh, however, due to the job changing, one person has just retired, and uh, there's also another one who haven't shown in the meeting uh, for quite a while. So per the TSC suggestion in last meeting, we run a voting process to introduce uh, several new members into the committee. And uh, there are uh, uh, Overall, uh, six candidates uh, who are waiting to join the committee, and uh, um, per the voting result, uh, um, the top two are uh, Jianan Guo, who is from uh, IBM in Beijing, and uh, the second person is uh, Zheng Hua Zhao, uh, who is also from IBM, but her his location is at Shenzhen. So uh, we plan to uh, accept uh, these two persons into the committee. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. A question for you. So I know in some other working groups that we had, um, having multiple chairs has led to some issues, kind of, I guess, similar to what you, you're, you were seeing, right? With people not showing up or, or that sort of thing. Um, just wondering, like the rest of our working groups now, I believe all have a single chair. Um, is there a, um, a reason that the technical working group China wants to go with multiple chairs? Yeah, actually, um, when the group was founded, um, the three um, co-chairs were uh, nominated uh, and by uh, Bren. And uh, after running for a while, we think uh, this way is uh, quite uh, suitable for the Technical Working Group China. Uh, that is because um, the, the TWC is a uh, very, uh, it's a special Technical work Group other, uh, compared with other uh, groups because it, uh, um, it's a bridge uh, between the local community and the glo global community and also it runs works in terms of um, documentation, technical contribution, and events, and lots of uh, works. So there are um, many jobs to run. So we guess to uh, maintain a committee that within several co-chairs might be more efficient. Okay, so the chairs are then kind of running sub subgroups within the Technical Working Group China. Yeah. We hopefully there are around uh, like a three person to uh, serve as co-chair. Any more questions?
So for the sake of this call, is this just uh, an update to the TSC? Are you looking for some level of approval? Um, um, I'm not sure whether that um, needs a approval, but uh, uh, certainly we will welcome for any suggestion or question. Are there any questions or any objections from, from the TSC? I think you had fairly, fairly recently given an update, so I know I don't have any questions based on already having recently been updated and uh, don't see any reason uh, to uh, uh, get in the way at all of the decision that the working group has made on, on the leadership there. May I suggest it's Marta uh, that there is a quick uh, round of at least acceptance from the TSC because that way we are aligning all the groups together. Otherwise we are re expecting other groups to have a vote from TSC and this one will be special. Yeah, so uh, from the TSC members on the call, um, all in favor to for Bauhaus proposal, please say aye. 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 Any, aye. Object? Any opposed? Any abstaining? All right. So that that's good to move forward. Thanks, Bauhaus. Thanks. And thanks, Marta. All right. That brings us to the end of the agenda. Uh, Happy to give everyone 15 minutes back, but if there are questions, comments, thoughts, um, let's work through those in the last 15 minutes as well. All right, hearing none, um, we'll, we'll wrap up a little bit early and have a good Wednesday, everyone. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.